Let's read together our text. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. The first three chapters of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. <coughs> Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother, unto the church of God which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours, grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Beloved, the Bible has a lot to say on the subject of the church and the church's unity. I want now just to consider briefly simply the epistles of the Apostle Paul. Two of Paul's canonical letters treat what we might call the theology of the unity of the church. The book of Ephesians has as its theme the church as the body of Jesus Christ. And therefore the church has one Lord, one faith and one baptism amongst other ones. Paul's epistle to the Colossians emphasizes the truth that Jesus Christ is the head of the church. And since all fullness dwells in Jesus Christ, all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, all wisdom and knowledge are treasured up in him, then we are complete in him, needing nothing else from any other source especially no man-made traditions or humanistic philosophies. Besides Ephesians and Colossians on the theology of the unity of the church, at least three of Paul's other epistles treat the church's unity in the light of concrete situations and even problems when the church's unity was under attack. There's indications, for instance, in the book of Philippians that there was a certain amount of pride and strife in the church. And there were a couple of women, Eurodius and Syntyche, who were engaged in petty squabbles. Philippians 2, verse 2, contains Paul's exhortation, Fulfill ye my joy, that is, may my happiness become complete, that ye be one, like-minded, two, having the same love, three, being of one accord, four, of one mind, and then he presents the humility and even the humiliation of our Lord Jesus Christ in his life on earth as the great example. The unity of the church was especially under attack in 2 Corinthians through the activities of false teachers. 1 Corinthians, our interest this morning, refers in several places to factions in the congregation. Factions caused not so much by particular false teachers or even by heresies, but factions caused by worldly thinking and attitudes. And so after Paul's introductory greeting, he states in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10, 
Now I beseech you, I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, number one, and that two, there be no divisions among you, but that three, ye be perfectly joined together, in four, the same mind, and five, in the same judgment. So like Philippians 2, verse 2, he heaps up and stresses the completeness and fullness of the unity which Jesus Christ commands in his church. Evidently, therefore, the practical problem of church disunity is not an uncommon one in the church. It's certainly not desirable, but it happens. It happens, of course, through the result of sin, many sins, and it even happened in churches established and instituted by the Apostle Paul himself, or churches established by others to which he wrote, like Colossians. The good news, of course, is that the problem of church disunity, like every other spiritual problem, can be solved and resolved. You see that in the pages of the New Testament. And the even better news is that church unity can be, that is, realized and enjoyed to the advantage and blessing of everyone. Now our text this morning could be divided into three parts. Verse 1 basically tells us from whom, humanly speaking, this apostle came. Verse 2 tells us to whom it was sent. And then verse 3 is the blessing, the blessing conferred by Paul in Christ's name. Paul being the one mentioned in verse 1 especially. Blessing now conferred upon the church mentioned in verse 2. So verse 1 contains the author of the letter, Paul, and along with him Sosthenes. Verse 2 describes those addressed in this inspired epistle, with verse 3 containing the blessing. A very simple division. But we're going to view our text this morning, not so much dealing with the first verse, but we're going to view our text this morning on the theme, the Church of God, considering first the meaning of it, beginning in verse 2, the universality of it in the second half of verse 2, and then the blessing upon it in verse 3. The Church of God, the meaning, the universality, and the blessing. Now the Christian church in verse 2, this congregation in Corinth, is called the Church of God. The Church of God. And that phrase, of God, in the statement of the Church of God, indicates ownership. The minister and the elders do not own the church. Wealthy members, those who give a lot to the church's offerings, don't own the church either, nor does their giving buy them a larger stake in the church than anybody else. The Limited Reform Fellowship, our missionary work in the Republic of Ireland, is not owned by us either. The Synod, or General Assembly of a denomination, does not own the congregations either. The state does not own the church. 
church is no creature of the civil government. The church is owned totally and exclusively by the triune God. He owns the church. He claims it as his own peculiar possession. It is called the church of God. It is his distinctive treasure and inheritance. He owns it. And God's owning this is his saying to all other claimants or rivals, keep your filthy hands off the church. It's mine. God owns the church as the one who redeemed the church, chose the church, and called it into existence. In fact, the Greek word for church includes the word call. Call. And the reference in call is not simply the external preaching, which even unbelievers can hear, but the call, which is incorporated in the Greek word for church, means the effectual, inward, converting, saving call of God. That's included in the word church. And so the church then is a group of people called by God as the ones he has chosen before the foundation of the world, as the ones for whom Jesus Christ has laid down his life and shed his blood, and as the one Therefore, this group and body that God has spoken to inwardly and so constituted as his church. He has brought us and all his people into existence by the work of the Holy Spirit through the preaching of his word and gospel. So the congregation of Corinth here or anywhere else where a true church is instituted, the congregation is called the Church of God because since God has created the church, he owns her completely and entirely and exclusively. <coughs> this is what we sing, for instance, in Psalm 100, verse 3. Know ye that the Lord, he is God, it is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. And that isn't simply referring to the creation of us as human beings. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. He that has made us as his people. Because it goes on to say, we are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. And so in this regard, the Christian church is like the creation itself. God owns the creation because he made it. And God owns the church because he made it. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. God owns the created order, for he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Psalm 24 verses 1 and 2. And so therefore, as the sole and absolute owner of the church, the triune God determines everything about his church. God determines the membership of the church. Man does not become a member of the church by his own free will. He can become a member of the false church by his own free will. He can become a hypocritical member of a true church by his own free will. But he cannot become a member of God's church by his free will. Instead, God makes people members of his church by his free will. And God's free will free will that you hear practically nothing about is the important free will. God's free will is perfectly free. It's determined by the absolute sovereignty of his own being. And God's free will is his sovereign election. 
That's God's free will, which always issues in his effectual, saving, converting, and preserving call. It's the church of God. God determines who is in his church. If you have a birthday party, you determine who you want to come to that birthday party. And no gate crashers. Not everybody may be able to come, but you determine. And God is his church, and he determines who's in and who's out. He chooses, and his will is sovereign. God not only determines the membership of his church, but he determines the roles within his church. Man does not make himself an elder or a minister or a deacon. And if he does make himself such, if he pushes himself forward and is given some role in a church, the whole thing's a disaster. God calls people to office. Because Jesus Christ is the sole king and head of the church. The sovereign God, by the Lord Jesus, and through his Holy Spirit, also gives to each and every member of the church, young and old, their part in the body, their function and role in the body which is the church. Ears, hands, and bones, all the other parts. Christ determines that. Christ also gives gifts and grace to each member in the body as pleases him. No members of the body have the same gifts or the same measure of grace. We don't even know how much grace we are given, never mind how much grace everybody else has, so we can never rank ourselves. These are invisible, unknowable things in this life. Christ, the repository of all grace, the one filled with the Spirit, gives to each member of the body not only the rules, but sufficient grace for them in their roles. He does that. It's his church. His church. And as the absolute sovereign, everything is under the dominion of his scepter. We can say not only the membership and the rules of the church are determined by God, who owns the church from top to bottom, but the location of a church and its beginning and its ending are all in God's hands. Where it is, Christ determines. When it starts and when it ends, Christ determines. Why do we meet and why are we meeting today in Balamina? Well, you could say, there are various levels at which you can answer that question, that some members in the past decided that this would be a good central location for the membership and with opportunities for growth. That's a true statement. Ultimately, the triune God, through Jesus Christ, caused us to be located here. And Jesus Christ builds his church and he builds it here as he has pleased so that there are people who come here and are here this morning from Balamina or Belfast or Burnside or Glynn or Kales or Clock Mills. And there are people who have been gathered here or even moved near from different parts of the country or different parts of the Giles. <coughs> Outside the British Isles, because of the will of Jesus Christ, he institutes the church, he chooses the members, he determines the rules of all the members in the body as pleases him, and he holds the future of this church and every other true church in his own safe, wise, powerful hands. It's the church of God. And it was precisely the same with the Church of God at Corinth in the first century. God built that church through the labors of the Apostle Paul in his second missionary journey round about A.D. 50. Some of the children will be here very soon, and some of them 
have heard in the last few weeks. So God chose to establish a church in Corinth, the capital of Achaia. It's interesting that Paul was told to labor in Corinth for a longer time than usual because, as Christ said to him in a vision, I have much people. <coughs> Stay longer than usual in Corinth, Paul, because there are a lot of elect there of whom I'm going to gather a congregation. So God chose in Corinth, the capital of Achaia, the southern half of what we call Greece, Sosthenes, mentioned in verse 1 of our chapter, Justus and Crispus, mentioned in Acts 18, Gaius and Stephanus, mentioned also in 1 Corinthians 1. Verses 14 and 16. <coughs> and in fact, this church at Corinth, we know for sure, did not consist of many great men, or mighty men, or wise men, but it consisted in the main of weak people, foolish people, poor people, and even people who are not. That's what it says in the last few verses of the chapter, which is an encouragement to us because that's the way we are too. God called this body of believers to be an instituted church with their own office bearers and sacraments and church discipline. The church of God at Corinth. Now as this church of God in Corinth here, he called them out of the wicked world spiritually. And Corinth had a bad reputation even in the Roman Empire. Corinth was like San Francisco or <coughs> had an ungodly reputation. The word for church in the Greek doesn't only include the word call, but it also includes the word out, speaking English. To call and to call out of. And so the church is that which is called out of the world, not out of the world geographically. We are very much in the world geographically. We couldn't even go out of the world geographically if we tried. Jesus prayed in John 17, not that God would take us out of the world geographically, but he would keep us in the world geographically. But the church is called out of the world spiritually. The church is called out of the sinful world. Which means the very word church contains in itself the antithesis, don't fear, the antithesis that simply means the radical spiritual opposition between Christian and non-Christian, believer and unbeliever, church, world, light, darkness, righteousness and unrighteousness, that truth is built into the church by definition. The truth of the antithesis, the spiritual enmity between the elect and the wicked, isn't some invention of Protestant Reformed churches or the Dutch Reformed tradition, or Augustine, who spoke of the city of God versus the city of the world. It's the teaching of the Holy Spirit from Genesis to Revelation. And it's the teaching that's even taught in the very word church. Which means that anyone who claims to be a member of the Christian church <coughs> is saying I have been called spiritually out of wickedness and evil in which I used to wallow. And I have been called out of this sin as a member of the body of Jesus Christ. Therefore I am by definition as a Christian, as a member of the church of Jesus Christ, different from and separate from ungodliness. And I am called to live antithetically. And by the grace of God, I do. I live holy. Not absolutely or even near it. But I do live holy. And Jesus Christ is that sort of a Christ. He is not a Christ for all men. He's not a Christ who includes 
everybody. He excludes people. Depart from me, ye accursed. I never knew you. He's not an inclusive Christ. He includes in his church on the basis of election and faith. Those who don't believe, he says, no. The key of the kingdom is turned and you are on the outside. The antithetical Christ is first presented even in the prophecy of Genesis 3.15 as the seed of the woman who is opposed to by the seed of the serpent. God puts enmity. Makes them enemies. And as a member of Christ and a member of his church, you must be and are antithetical, spiritually different from the world. You've got to live in the light of that reality of what God has made you by his grace and what God has made you. As a member of the church, you must live wholly over against the sinful world around you. So that the church must not see its calling to be as much like the world as possible. The church must see its calling to be as much like Jesus Christ as possible so that those who are outside of Jesus Christ ought to have a healthy fear of joining the church. That's a good thing. They ought to be afraid to join the church. Acts 5 verse 13 says that after Ananias and Sapphira were struck dead for their lying to, to the church and to the Holy Spirit, nobody dared join the church. That's how it goes in the church where there's real holiness, where God takes sin seriously. I'm not sure I want to join. That fear is part of the fear of God. Because God dwells in the church. And that fear is a good thing in that some who are outside and who are truly members of Christ will be brought to cleanse their wicked ways by God's grace and join truly and inwardly. This is the way it was with the Apostle Paul. He was called out of the wicked world one day on a journey to Damascus in order to persecute Christians when Christ appeared to him. Sosthenes, also mentioned in verse 1, was called. <coughs> Some saints are called by God's grace into the kingdom in our infancy, and others are called later in life as it pleases Christ. For he chooses not only who will be in the church, but when he will incorporate them into the church. Church of God. And I'd say that this call is negative. We are called out of something. It is also a very positive aspect because we are called into the church and into a life of holiness. Sanctification is spoken of in our text. It says, Paul is writing here unto the church of, which is, church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Definitively, powerfully, irresistibly sanctified. God has broken the power of sin in us and consecrated us to himself. That's a definitive act in every Christian. And then our growth in grace is also progressive and ongoing. We're sanctified in Jesus and we are called to be saints, holy ones. So we must live according to what we are in Jesus Christ. You may think at this stage, Paul is laying it on thick at the start of this epistle on sanctification, sainthood, holiness. And you may think this sounds strange given my knowledge says the Christian of 1 Corinthians because in this epistle Paul goes on to speak about divisions in the church and carnality and boastings. There's a man who's sleeping with his stepmother in chapter 5 and the church has initially refused to put him under discipline through Paul's admonition. They then discipline him but still they shouldn't need an apostle to tell them to do that. Some of them are considering at the very least taking others in the congregation to court, 1 Corinthians 6, and Paul calls them sanctified and saints. And he's doing this deliberately, reminding them of what they are, 
power so that they will start living the way they should live. And he's doing this truly. The church is holy. The Holy Spirit is in them. And they are doing good works as well. The fruit of the Spirit is in evidence in this congregation. Now we're not saying that the congregation was perfectly holy. Do you understand that? But there was real holiness there, despite the sins. We're not saying either that every member in the visible congregation in Corinth was holy. There's always goats among the flock, there's always some hypocrites. But we are saying that the group <coughs> is holy in that the members in the church, on the whole, though far from perfectly, are serving Christ. Though again, I have not absolutely every one of them. So Paul writes, unto the church of God, which is a part, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be saints. That's a description which can be applied to every true congregation of Jesus Christ, ourselves included. And we are, we're not as holy as we should be, nor near it, but we are making progress. That's the promise of God to his church. It grows in grace. Now this one mystical body of Jesus Christ, which he chooses before the foundation of the world, it comes to manifestation in more places than simply Corinth. There are Jewish churches and Gentile churches, or mostly Jewish churches and mostly Gentile churches that we read of in the pages of the New Testament. There's a church in Jerusalem, the mother church where it all started, and it has somewhat different customs than the church in Corinth. Different customs, adiaphora, things that in themselves are indifferent. There are differences too in non-essentials between Corinth and Rome and Ephesus and Antioch. But there is essential unity. There are common activities, the passage speaks of that. Prayer, worship and confession. Paul writes to this church of God, which is at Corinth, and then he goes on to say, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. And so our text goes on to speak not only of this individual congregation, but of other churches who are part of the one Catholic or universal Church of Christ. Our Belgian Confession begins in Article 27, the first article of the Church. We believe and profess one Catholic or universal Church, which is a holy congregation of true Christian believers, all expecting their salvation of Jesus Christ, being washed by His blood, sanctified and sealed by the Holy Ghost. In Article 29, we have a superb description of Christians in the Church. With respect to those who are members of the Church, they may be known by the marks of Christians. There's the three marks of the true Church, and there are also the marks of Christians. Namely, number one, by faith. And when they have received Jesus Christ, the only Saviour, they avoid sin, follow after righteousness, Love the true God of their neighbor, neither turn aside to the right or left, and crucify the flesh with the works thereof. But this is not to be understood as if there did not remain in them great infirmities, but they fight against them through the Spirit all the days of their life, continually taking refuge in the blood, passion, death, and obedience of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom they have remission of sins through faith in Him. So, it is the calling of Christians to receive people like this, as described by the Belgian Confession 27 and 29, as Christian brothers and sisters who serve the common Lord upon whose name we all call, referring to all sorts of nationalities, Argentinians and Indians and Jews and Pakistanis and Germans. Irish people, English people, one Lord. And you one Lord, no matter what colour of skin you may have, one Lord. And 
there is one Lord for all true believers in Christian denominations. Now, obviously, we're not talking about like pagans or idolaters, like Roman Romanism or cults or modernism, but we're talking about believers. Believers. Believers, too, in true churches, which always have differing degrees of purity, as our confession says. So our attitude towards them is humility, we're not puffed up. Love, because we are to owe no man anything but to love one another. We're to do good to all those, who, to all men, and especially those who are the household of faith. Galatians 6 verse 10, we pray not only for ourselves, but for all of God's people, near and far. And we also owe all men, including all Christians, of course, the truth. Like Priscilla and Aquila to Apollos, explaining more fully and perfectly in the way of the Lord. So if the Christian always buys the truth and sells it not, he never compromised it by God's grace one iota because it's not his truth to deal with. God owns the truth just as he owns the church. We pray too that the Lord will spread it. And in that way, we encourage and promote spiritual, true unity on the basis of the truth of God's word amongst believers. And when we pray too, the Lord's Prayer, we begin, Our Father, which art in heaven. Our Father. Our Father. Which means that in our prayers, consciously too, we pray with all saints in all the earth, near and far. That's why Paul writes to the Church of God, which is at Corinth, this local instituted church, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours, because we don't have a monopoly on the name of Jesus Christ. We're not the only ones of whom he is Lord, both theirs and ours. And now upon this instituted church of God at Corinth, and by extension too, this applies to all true Christian churches, the Apostle Paul delivers his epistolary blessing, or his letter blessing. Verse 3, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. And grace, of course, means in the first instance that beauty and perfection in the triune God. In the second instance, Grace refers to God's attitude of favor towards certain people in Jesus Christ. And now more specifically, the third, this is what the apostle is praying for. He prays for grace upon the church in terms of God's unmerited favor issuing in power, a transforming power in the hearts and lives of elect sinners in Christ Jesus, which gracious inward working of the Holy Spirit preserves us from the wicked world and purifies our hearts and lives more and more. Grace be unto you. The God who favors you, work by his Spirit inside you, keeping you from ungodliness and consecrating you more and more to himself. Grace be unto you. You need it. Church of Corinth, we need it today. Grace be unto you and peace. And peace is the fruit of this grace. Peace here is wholeness and completeness in Jesus Christ so that the believer experiences calm and repose sometimes in the midst of great provocation and storms, and he preserves a good conscience through faith in the one true gospel. 
So this church of God, as a spiritual body, needs all these spiritual blessings from the triune God, purchased by Jesus, and applied to us by his Spirit. Grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father, the triune God, and from, through our mediator, the Lord Jesus. But some of you will be aware that the Limerick Reformed Fellowship, not being an instituted church, also receives in its worship service the benediction, another word for the blessing. And so whatever the Gilman administers that benediction as part of the worship service, twice each Lord's Day as do visiting ministers. This is in accordance too with the decision made in the PRC Synod in 2001 and good grounds the administering of the apostolic blessing on the mission field in a non-instituted church. Because in the Bible, the benediction is delivered not only upon instituted congregations, but also upon individuals, not just to the Corinthian church, for instance, here, but also specific Christians like Timothy, or Titus, or Philemon, or in 3 John, Gaius. This is Ephesians 6, verse 24, the last words of that inspired epistle. Ephesians 6, verse 24. Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. Grace be with all them. This is Titus 3, <coughs> verse 15. Titus 3, verse 15. All that are with me, writes Paul, salute or greet you. Greet them that love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. And you may remember that Titus 1, verse 5 indicates that part of Titus' work as an evangelist or a helper to the Apostle Paul was to ordain elders in every city. So either all of these groups, or at the very least some of the groups of Christians on the island of Crete, where Titus currently was, were not instituted churches, like, in other words, the Limerick Reform Fellowship, but they still receive the blessing of grace be with you all. Amen. And of course, our missionary Reverend McGill is able to administer the blessing by virtue of his ministerial office as a representative of Jesus Christ called to be a preacher. And he does that by virtue of the authority given to him to preach, which is therefore also the authority to administer the blessing. Because of the group too, it is a manifestation of the organism, the living body of the church. And God blesses people basis of that too. <coughs> then it is an organism, a body, a living body of believers not yet organized with the goal of receiving by the will of God office bearers in due time and becoming an instituted church with its own sacramental discipline and oversight. The idea with the blessing is it's putting God's name upon his people. Putting God's name upon his people. That's what happens in preaching. The name of God, God in his virtues, is revealed in Jesus Christ and in his works, goes out to the church. This is what happens too in baptism. We baptize into the name, into the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. And the Aaronitic blessing, in Numbers chapter 6, is explained in Numbers 6, verse 27, that through the words, the Lord bless thee, and make his face shine upon thee, etc., they shall put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. 
The blessing of God's people is God putting his name upon them. That is God coming to them, meeting with them, joining them into his fellowship. That's what it is to be, to be blessed. So that in the blessing, Jesus Christ confers grace and mercy and peace to his people in the way of a true and living faith. And that preserves us. One means that God uses to preserve us as the manifestation of his one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And may that grace and peace go with us each one. Amen.